fugitive girl caught in a web of desire. Betrayed by her lover, pimp killer, dope smuggler, bank embezzler, lesbian leader of the pack. An illicit love affair behind prison walls. No one under 16 will be admitted unless accompanied by a parent or guardian. Only you can judge if your children are mature and intelligent enough to witness the frank and revealing scenes in this film. Welcome to Singapore. In a school in Singapore, I suppose not unlike any other school in Singapore, a 16-year-old boy entered the boys' toilets. And out of the 12 stalls that were there for his perusal, they were all empty except one. It was then the 16-year-old approached this occupied stall. And he knocked on the door of this stall. When the occupant asked what he wanted, the knocker politely asked him to open the stall door, to which the occupant courteously obliged. It was then that the 16-year-old raised an axe and cut off the 13-year-old boy's arm. Oh, then, he cut off the second arm. Oh, then, raising the axe again, he swung it down, cutting the 13-year-old's head open like a walnut. After this, he walked out into the hallway, washed his axe in the drinking fountain, and took a cool, refreshing drink. The officials were notified and arrived at the school accordingly. The 13-year-old was dead and dismembered on the bathroom floor. Panicked students were ordered to stay in their classroom. When police questioned the 16-year-old on how he could commit such a heinous crime, he said he honestly didn't know. It was like some unseen force had taken hold of him and he was just a vessel. It was during this questioning that one of the officers, a history buff, received the notification on his phone. And it read that on this day, 161 years ago, Lizzie Borden was born. I guess it's true what they say. And no kids these days really have any original ideas. <laughs> In this world, there are things that go beyond our understanding. Things that our tiny minds cannot possibly comprehend. Like when does reality end and dreams begin? Between the flick of a light switch and a dream, we continually shroud ourselves in a veil of illusion. Going missing isn't exactly new. Runaways, abduction, people on the lam. But either way, missing persons are usually found. Either safe and sound, or ass up in a forest somewhere, wrapped in plastic with three months worth of rot. A meal deal to the maggots. But there's usually always some kind of closure. And if there isn't, there's something fucked up, like Kreskin or something like that. Case in point, take 17-year-old Brianna Maitland. The former wild child and party girl had changed her ways and gone straight. She was now working two jobs and had plans to go back to college in the new year. But sometimes planning for the future is like flying in the face of God. Working as a waitress at a local choking puke, Rihanna left work at about 11.20 p.m. She turned down co-workers' invitation to stay behind for a couple of drinks because she had to get up early and work on a second job. By all accounts, and if witnesses are to be believed, Brianna got into her car and drove off alone. Several witnesses would later come forward and say that that night they saw a vehicle matching the description of Brianna's car parked by the side of the road with its lights on, but no one inside. This, of course, has never been confirmed. It 
It was the next day that several passerbys would note seeing a car strangely backed up into an abandoned house. And although no one reported it, they started taking pictures of the oddity. I guess people in this part of the country get excited easily. Either way, there's no denying that it was an odd sight. A police officer later that day figured that it had been abandoned by a drunk and impounded it, but didn't call in the plate numbers. Brianna, or Bree as she was known as, wasn't reported missing until four days afterwards because it wasn't unusual for her to not return home. She also didn't mind doing a little crap to feel sexy, although friends say that was behind her. And although the cops went and interviewed people at her work, they clearly weren't taking her disappearance too seriously. But it was when the piggies returned her impounded car back to her parents two weeks later that her father noticed that there were two paychecks on the front seat, her medication, her contact lenses. Even if she were a crackhead, she would have still needed a paycheck to get the crack. And they now realized that something was wrong. Because Brianna had basically disappeared like a fucking ghost. A pretty cute teenage crack smoking ghost. Or apparently used to smoke crack. <laughs> she has a nice pussy. Over the years, there's been several theories about what happened to Brianna Maitland. Two weeks before her disappearance, she got a shit kicking from a former friend who accused her of trying to steal her man. Cops figure it might be her former friend settling at a court. Another theory was that it was drug related. It was no secret that Bree liked a bit of blow for foreplay. And it's not unreasonable to think that someone took care of her because her tab were running too high. With another of those theories being that she disappeared of her own free will, starting a new life to get the monkey off her back. With pictures later circulating of a girl who looked exactly like Brie playing craps in Atlantic City. But either way, none of these theories have ever played out. And the teenager, 17 years later, still remains missing. With Vermont's finest, saying that it's the most baffling case that they've ever encountered in the history of the Force. In this life, we really do take for granted that we are playing a numbers game. Death stalks us at every corner, and life it's just a game of craps. But sometimes, there is a mystery beyond the remits of our tiny little minds. Mysteries that are not meant to be solved, and only the darkest remits of our imagination can come up with the questions, but we'll never be able to find the answers. Case and point. George and Jenny Sada were Italian immigrants who came to America from Italy in the late 1890s. They wanted the good life, and by the 40s they were getting it, riding a gravy train with biscuit wheels. And the couple had 10 beautiful kids together, which means they must have really liked children, or Mr. Sada had mastered the art of pulling out. But sexual practices and where Mr. Sada blew his load aside, the Sada's one goal was to give their kids the good life. But nothing in this sweet ass world lasts forever. Nothing. It was on Christmas Eve and the kids had all been able to open up one of their gifts and they'd gone to bed and were waiting for Santa. The phone rang at about 12.30 a.m. and Jenny Sada answered it and there was a mysterious woman on the other end laughing like a witch. <laughs> Thinking it was the wrong number, Jenny hung up and went back to sleep. It was about 1 a.m. in the morning that she heard something on the roof. A bang, and then it sounded like it was rolling down. But again, she ignored it and went back to sleep. An hour later, she could smell smoke, and she woke up her husband, George. And despite the heat and the flames, he rushed from room to room trying to save his children, dropping them out of the second floor window. But eventually, the heat, the smoke, it was too much, and he abandoned the home that he built and the children that he helped make. Out of George and Jenny's 10 children, one of them was away serving in the army. And the nine that were asleep in the home that night, he rescued four and left five to the flames. But bizarrely enough, a couple of days after the fire, when the embers had all cooled down, firefighters and investigators started poking around. They could find no signs of the children, not even a tooth. They figured that the fire had been so intense, it just melted them like Italian kid candles. 
and they couldn't figure out how the fire started. When word started spreading around town of the terrible tragedy, inadvertently, there were rumors and gossip. George Sada had never shared with anyone why he'd left Italy and come to America, and how he'd made all his money. With racial stereotypes being what they were, there was a lot of talk about him being in the mob. Maybe he double-crossed someone, ratted him out, and for payment, they whacked his kids. Mr. Sada were also known to be very outspoken and made more than a few enemies in the Italian community, especially with his hatred towards the Italian dictator Mussolini. And when he spoke to the police, he told them that he didn't believe the kids had been in the house when the fire started, and that fire was deliberate, and that someone or someones had abducted his children. It was then he related a story where an insurance man had come around the house trying to sell him house insurance, and when they refused, he told them that the house was gonna burn down, and his kids would perish. Jeez, talk about the hard sell. He must be on commission. He also related the story about the strange phone call that Christmas Eve and the cackling lady who laughed like a witch. But police checked it out and nothing came of the two stories. Time passed, but the Sardas failed to accept that their children had died in that house fire. And they hired a private detective to prove it. What he found out was startling. That just before the fire had started, the house's phone lines had been cut. He also contacted a local crematorium who told him that bones remained even after a two hour fire of heat up to 2000 Fahrenheit, which far exceeded the house fire's heat. The private dick also found witnesses who said that they saw a car driving away from the house that appeared to have children struggling inside. He also found the insurance man who had threatened to burn down the house. And he'd had several anonymous tips that a heart had been found in the ashes and was buried in a metal box at the local graveyard. He tracked it down and dug it up, but found out it was a cow's heart. George Sada had contacted the FBI with this information, and he got a letter back from Hoover, the head of the FBI who told him that he'd love to help. But the local police hadn't asked for it, and that was the only way he'd be able to. Sadly, George Sada passed away in 1969, never finding out what happened to his children. Spending all the money into bankruptcy looking for that answer. They never rebuilt the house on the property and they turned it into a memorial for the children and placed a large billboard that offered a reward for any information. The billboard stayed up until 1989 when Jenny Sada died and then they removed the weathered billboard. The last of the known surviving children passed away in 2021. And to this day, it remains a mystery what happened to the five Sada children.